Chapter 11 Obida October 1884 In early morning, still thinking about what Tante Anna had said the night before about slavery, Timothy was fishing in Warboat Averill's rowboat. They were anchored near the coral reefs off Galosh Point, hand lining for grouper at about 35 feet. Also down there was Snapper, Jack, Mackerel, Barracuda, and Bonito, but Fat Grouper was what they were after. Later, when the sun was fully out, they'd be able to see the fan-covered reefs and the fish. Though he was sometimes foggy-headed after a night with demon rum, old Warbert knew more about fish and birds in the sea than any man alive. Timothy was sure of it. He knew the winds and the stars and the reefs. He knew the islands and the caves all the way south to Trinidad and Tobago, west of the Morants and Providencia. Timothy wanted his knowledge. Tante Anna had told Timothy, Listen to de old man, all de old man. If in day wise, then you be wise. Timothy thought of Warbert as his grandfather. He looked like a grandfather and talked like a grandfather. He often said, Riddle me this or riddle me that. Wilbert told the best stories about fish and jumbies, the evil spirits. Timothy both believed them and didn't believe them at the same time. Once Wilbert told him about catching a barra that was seven feet long. Timothy didn't think that any barracuda could be seven feet long. Four feet, maybe even five feet. Never seven. Wilbert showed him the palm of his right hand where the line had cut in inch deep until the barrel broke it. And one morning, about 10 o'clock, Warbert said breathlessly, Look down! Look down! Timothy looked down, and there was a seven-foot barracuda swimming slowly by them. One big eye cocked at the boat. Warbert's best stories about jumbies was the one where Mama Geeches battled a jumbie under the stairwell of Hotel 1829. It was the Ob- Obada woman who lived in Bakoa and cast spells. The smoke jumbie was threatening to burn the hotel down till Mama Geechis, who was less than four feet tall, fought it and killed it with ground-up butterflies. Her throat and private parts had gone scratched. Orbert had seen her throat scratches, but not the others. Until she got in a knee bursted in the storm off Baruba, Warbert had sailed the Caribbean and offshore Atlantic for 47 years. Foy foe, he reminded everybody. Now his right knee was as stiff and useless as a gravestone. He walked peg leg like his right one was wooden. He could no longer get around a sailing ship deck. Timothy liked to sail into the harbor when they had a good catch. Warbert blowing his conch shell. ah ah to announce they had a fish for sale. Timothy wanted to talk about being a slave, but Warbur accidentally hooked a goatfish in the gill and was taking great care in getting it off the hook, using a cloth to protect his hands from the sharp fins. Never eat the fish. Don't even let him stick you. Timothy had heard Warbur say that every time he hooked an unwanted goatfish Warbert had an old man's habit of repeating himself, as he was expected to do. Timothy asked, why not? Poison. He makes what you got goat rot. There's a Spanish word for it. Cigar something. That meant the same. Make you very sick. Then Timothy knew that Warbert, who had a wizened face like a dark brown nutmeg and crinkled gray hair, would tell him, Once again, that goat fish could be poison off St. Thomas, but good to eat off Guadalupe. Warbert had an idea that goat fish nibbled sour coral on some reefs, not on others. Timothy listened him out, then said the Omega had sailed without him. Warbert, looking sharply from under his straw hat's brim, said, I heard so. Maybe you better all staying here, doing land walk. Look at what the sea did to me. He slapped his busted leg. Though he was sixty-odd, 
His eyes were those of a young eagle, sharp as knife tips. Timothy shook his head to disagree. Then he said he'd keep trying and change the subject. You ever been a slave, Warbert? Clouds were drifting in and the sun had come up, dropping yellow patches over the waters east of Galosh Point. A vagrant easterly breeze notched the blue surface, rippling it, causing tiny waves to slap against the boat's port side with a hollow sound. Warbert's sound was a half chuckle. He said, Oh, yas! Oh, yas! Strange, like Tante Anna. He'd never talked about it before, as if it was something to be ashamed of. He had been 20 the year of emancipation, he said. It was the same year he'd gone to sea. Timothy jerked on his line and soon landed a three-pound grouper that drummed the boat's bottom with its tail. Unhooked, it still flapped as Timothy angled the stringer cord through the gills and out of the mouth, and then tossed it back overboard. Why, you asked! Timothy said Tante Anna had said how it was with her. Warbert said, We all the same. Me and her just got lucky we didn't have to make the trip across. We born in St. Thomas. Timothy said he wanted to know how it was with Warbert when he was a boy. Warbert laughed again. They made me ten chickens when I was five. I had caca between my toes till I was twelve. Caca was chicken dung, Timothy knew. Then they put me in the fields, holing. We dug holes about four feet square and nine inches deep with heavy holes. By noon, my arms ached, but I'd get a kick in my behind if I'd slowed up. Next, we forked manure into the holes, then planted cane cutting. You do that every day? Only at planting time. Rest of the time, the chillin' weeded till, we, till the cane was cut. Then the fires begun in the boiling houses to make molasses. You worked all the time, Timothy asked. Sun up to sundown, except on Sunday. In boiling time, the man worked every day. Warbert talked about how it was to be a slave almost until noon. When they sailed back toward shore, the last thing he said about it was, you lucky being born after Freedom Day. That was true, Timothy realized. Orward added, One thing I learned when I was a chicken boy. Black hens lay white eggs. Then he cackled and cackled. <laughs> riddle me dish, riddle me that, slapping his useless leg. Timothy wasn't sure what he meant. He'd ask Tante Hannah later. He trudged to back a wall with two fat groupers. One to give away, one to cook. A layer of floating whiteness wood smoke made a roof over back a wall just before sunset and trapped the rich food smells that came from the open fires outside the huts. Tante Hannah was almost ready to take the boiling moth sauce, diced pork, onions, tomatoes, and the cooked flaked grouper from the embers and pour it over the fungi. Cornmeal shaped into balls. She stirred in some of her own hand-picked bay leaves and ginger, then took a sniff, nodding. She went back into the hut and brought out two plates. The fair dawn weather had continued into the twilight, the trade wind picking up a cool edge in late afternoon. The heat of the charcoal would feel good once they sat down to eat. Soon, Tante Anna served a simple meal, saying a blessing over it before they took their first bites. While they were eating, Mama Geeches came over, uninvited, and sat down by Tante Anna, the bird-like tiny woman always dressed in lavender and wearing silver rings on her baby-sized fingers, was paid to chase chumbies. She was also paid to bring good luck. It was said that Loop Guru, the man-spirit who took off his clothes and flew by night in a ball of fire, sucking blood from his victims, played with Mama Geeches just after she was born. He introduced her to the world of spirits, including Sokiant, the female 
Loop Guru. Mama Geeches lived two huts down. She stared moodily into the fire. She shook her head when Tante Anna offered her some moth and fungi. Timothy had always been afraid of her. Tiny, though, she was. He was afraid of her old country spells and magic. There were many stories about Mama Geeches. She was neither young nor old, neither living nor dead. Even buckras came down from their mansions in the hills to visit Mama Geeches for one reason or another. Finally, looking over at Timothy with sleepy, dark eyes that were barely visible in the crimson glow, she said, Pay me two krona, and I'll sink the Omega. Her voice was that of a little girl. Was there anyone on the whole island who didn't know he'd been left behind? Mama Geecha seemed to hear everything that went on. The Omega was likely 200 miles along her northerly course to New York. Sinker? Tante Anna bristled at the thought. We'll do no such thing. Mama Geeches still looked intently into Timothy. Pay me two krona and I'll get you a good ship. Frowning, Tante Anna said carefully and uneasily, he'll get his own ship when it's time. Mama Geeches slowly rotated her head toward Tante Anna to threaten, and it'll be a goat mouse ship, a bad luck ship. Retreating, Tante Anna said, she couldn't afford two krona, having just spent her savings on shoes and pants. Mama Gijas rose, moved off into the shadows, soundless as a mongoose, for which Timothy was grateful. He let out a long, whoo, relieved. Another such breath came from Tante Anna. As Mama Gijas moved beyond what they thought was hearing range, Tante Anna said bravely, don't fret. You know, she's just a silly old bede woman. But the tense look on her face said something else. It said that she was as afraid of the miniature Jumbi chaser as he was. Always have been. Always will be. Like boom balloon drums, Mama Geeches got it into everybody's head and gullet with her words. Because they were mysterious words. Powerful words. Everybody listened. Within his memory, Tante had to pay Mama Geeches to get rid their yard and hut of visiting Jumbi several times. Once Mama Geeches sat on the doorstep holding a chicken in her lap, talking to the ch chicken until it fell asleep. She sat there all night, and at daybreak the chicken awakened and the Jumbi circling the hut like a rope of fog departed. How long is a day on Neptune? First ten people to correctly answer the question will get 1,000 points. Another time, a Jumbi got into Tante Anna's left foot through a spider bite hole and wouldn't leave. The wood swelled up like a big red banana. Weeds wouldn't cure it, but Mama Geeches did. She went to the graveyard and got some dust, then added ground up chalk and pieces of snake root Tante Anna soaked her foot all night in the nearly boiling cure water, and by morning, the Jumbi swelling had gone. So Timothy, too, believed in Mama Geech's Obida. And that night, when the plantain leaves, he decided to start saving ore until he had two krona to make sure he wouldn't get a goat mount ship when he finally went to sea.